Hello and welcome to GFM at Home. It's great to have you join us again this week. Before we kick off, we want to wish Alex Sayer a big congratulations on turning the big 70 today, Sunday. Alec, we hope you have a great day and a wonderful year ahead. Bless you. Next week, the 21st, we'll be doing a brew by Zoom again at 11.45. The details for that will be on the screen at the end. It'll be great to see you at that again to have some fellowship after the service. And also next week, we're trialing something new. We're going to be premiering our video on YouTube. Now what that means is that those of you that have a sneak peek of the video late on Saturday evening or first thing really, really early on Sunday, you won't be able to do that anymore because we want to try and get used to being in the routine again of church together on a Sunday morning. So the video will only become available at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday next week. So if you click onto the link, which will be posted in the regular places, basically there'll be a nice screen saying, welcome to our service, we're gonna go live shortly, and then we can all watch it together at 10.30. There's a little chat function on the side so we can talk to each other and engage together, and just we can see how many people are watching together, and we can encourage each other in that. Just something new going forward to get us used to doing church together on a Sunday morning. Pastor Ian is continuing our series today on living free, and he's going to be looking at how do we live free in a money-mad world. But for now, over to the band. Let's worship together. So good morning and welcome from... Welcome from church. And not just from the upstairs, but from our new wonderful sanctuary. Praise God for his faithful provision of this building and our safekeeping during this pand pandemic. It's just really great to be here this evening recording with Mark and Tracy and Jake and Peter. It's just such a blessing uh, to be together. And as this is the first gathering of the worship group in this new sanctuary, I thought it would be good to begin our worship with a declaration of God's faithfulness for his provision and to follow that with a prayer that just in the past he would fill this place with his presence. And as you worship at home, I just encourage you to similarly pray that God's presence would abound where you are. Now, some of you might notice that both of the songs, uh, the first two songs, involve an invitation to lift up your hands in worship. And the reason for this, because at one point, there was a possibility that this was going to be our first service back at church with a congregation. And under current rules, obviously, there'd be no congregational singer, only one singer is allowed. But I just wanted to give you... Uh, a, a, an opportunity to encourage you to respond in worship by raising your hands. Now, as it turns out, uh, we're all still at home, but perhaps you'd still like to try it this morning. Try raising your hands in worship. Get, get some muscle memory in for the weeks to come. I'll just leave that with you. Anyway, let, let's pray. Father God, we come this morning and we want to thank you for your faithfulness for the provision of this building and bringing us to this point. We want to thank you that you are the God of the new thing, and we pray that all that is new about this building will be used for your glory alone, that it would aid us in loving you, that it would aid us in loving our neighbors as ourselves, and it would aid us in making disciples of all nations. And yes, while you're the God of the new thing, we also thank you that you are the God that does not change, that you are eternally loving and true. And our prayer this morning is that there are some things about this building that, that would also not change, that this building would always be a place where your word is spoken with authority, a place where your name is lifted high, a place where it is continually declared that Jesus Christ is Lord. And finally, a place where your spirit rests and moves amongst us, empowering us for service. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
so we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. Yeah.
prison like a rushing wind. Send your spirit here, breath of heaven, breathe on us. Breath of heaven, breathe on us. Today here in the UK we celebrate Mother's Day, which is such an opportunity to say thank you. But we acknowledge that this day brings pain and sadness to so many, perhaps through loss, regret or longing. And as we remember the significance of mothers and of mothering, today Lord we look to you, the all-sufficient one, and there is so much to say thank you for. I am grateful for my mum and dad because they help educate us and nurture us to be good people who love God. I am thankful for my family, friends and heaven. I am thankful for music and time.
Dear God, thank you for the skill and knowledge of the NHS. Thank you for pets, guide dogs and old companion pets. Thank you for our cousins who we love and are very grateful for. Amen. Dear God, we thank you that we have been able to continue with our education despite the very difficult circumstances schools and our teachers have had. We thank you for all of our teachers, teaching, support and admin staff and pray that you will continue to help them as they work so hard in our schools. Thank you God for life. Thank you God for music. Thank you that we can worship you, connect with others and express ourselves through it and that it can help us through hard times. Also, thank you for books. Thank you for the escapism they provide and the joy they can release. Finally, thank you for the seasons and the way they change and fit together so perfectly and for the lovely spring weather at the moment. Thank you for your beautiful creation you've given us to enjoy and look after. Thank you God that we can go back to school and thank you for all the people who have made this possible. Thank you that the building work at church is finished and that we have this amazing new space. I am thankful for my new job that I started before the beginning of lockdown which has enabled me to keep busy and I am also thankful for technology as it has enabled me to keep in contact with close friends and family. I am thankful for so many things at the moment but the thing at the top of my mind is a book that Jeff gave me for Christmas of daily readings for the year called Jesus Calling and it said don't keep rehearsing what might be we're only meant to go through things once and Jesus will be with me so trust in him and when I wobble I remember that and it's a great blessing so thank you God This period of time that Jean and I have gone through since January the 19th. In early days we had moments of emotion and a bit challenged, but after the prayer chain was in action, it just reminded me of when that passage in Revelations where the angels took the prayers of the saints and mixed them with incense in a bowl and then dashed them down on earth and they had an impact we know not how but we felt that impact of all the prayers of our family and friends and church people round about us from Lancaster, Garstown, Cornwall and we've known a peace and a comfort over the last three weeks that we couldn't have known unless we'd had the presence of God and I just want to thank my heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus for making this a reality in our experience. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, in the big things and the small things and all the in-between things, for the things you have given us and for all that you have done and are doing, today we say thank you. Help us, Lord, to live in the light of all of your goodness to us and really to share you with the world around us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Give us all we need, all 
Help us to love as you have loved us Now come and build your throne As we go where you go God, our deliverer We pray forever here today Your kingdom to reign Always here on earth as in heaven Here on earth as in heaven Yours To, to be with you and to be able to open up God's words together. But I've got a question that's going to guide us through today. How do we live in the freedom that Jesus won for us in a money mad world? You know that we all know deep down that money and wealth and possessions can become one of the greatest idols in our lives and most definitely are in our culture today. And as a disciple of Jesus there is no way of avoiding and having to work out the place of money in our lives. And it's no wonder that when you go back uh, into scripture uh, that Jesus devoted so much of his teaching uh, on his words that's recorded in the Gospels uh, talking about the resources that God has entrusted to us and including money. In the Old and New Testament alone there are over 800 verses on the subject, you know, covering a wide range of things from planning and budgeting to saving, investing and debt and tithing. But when you come back to Jesus, he stressed that we either worship our wealth or we worship with our wealth. You know, let me just remind you before we come to the reading today uh, of what he said uh, that's recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 24, when he said, No one can serve two masters. For he, he either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Money, therefore, you know, is either a tool or an idol. When wealth or, or the building of it, it is an idol, it can be worshipped in the pursuit of other perceived blessings, maybe, you know, such as comfort, security and status and power. But the Bible warns that money idolatry and the love of money, as we'll come across in a few moments, is most definitely a, a trap and that will rob us of our freedom. So let's come and open up uh, a letter from the Apostle Paul to a young church leader, his protege. And he left him in charge of an important church in a place called Ephesus on the western coast of Turkey. Uh, just opposite uh, Greece. And the city was the third most important and largest city on that side of the Mediterranean. And it had a population of about 250,000 people. It was wealthy, it was comfortable, and it was prosperous. But Paul covers a wide range of important issues. Uh, but there are some false teaching and practices going on that are opposite to what Jesus taught. Some of those leaders had gone astray and produced their own brand uh, of godliness, false teaching, which centred on rules and regulations. But they'd also been uh, uncovered 
that they were motivated by greed and that their ideas about godliness, devotion, was a means of gain. But Paul is inspired to raise some important points on how to not fall into the trap and how to live as a Christ follower, as to live in the freedom that he won for us in a money-mad world. So let me read for you from the first letter to Timothy in chapter 6, beginning to read part way through the second verse. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who've been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we've brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And then he continues just a little bit later from verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will, will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Amen. You know, it's no exaggeration to say that these passages and the really famous verses within it are such a challenge to all of us who live in the Western, materialistic, consumption-centred, money-ingrained culture today. Never before have so many people tripped over each other in the eagerness to get rich or to get that bit more, to get all that stuff, or to get that luxury stuff that only a lot of money can buy. And all too often, we're in danger of losing that freedom that Christ bought us. And, and even at lots of different levels, whatever our wealth is, that there is a danger that we can get trapped by greed and the consequences of it. The greatest irony is that we, yes, we all are in danger of falling into that trap. Actually, in the name of contentment, which is more or less the same as probably happiness. Many of us give lip service to the wisdom that money can't buy us happiness, but we secretly hope that it might just, after all, be true. The pursuit of happiness, money and wealth has implicitly become a basic human right. But if you're anything like me, as we look around and we see the unchecked pursuit of wealth, it quickly turns into a basic human wrong. You know, look at every advertisement, every other television programme, all so many films are designed by subtle and not so subtle means to tempt us, to make us feel inadequate, to make us feel dissatisfied, to make us feel envy for somebody else. You know, if only I had a just a bit more money. If only I could have that expensive stuff, then I'd be happy. Then I'd be content. Maybe our innermost thoughts are sometimes th summed up 
by the little story I heard about Nelson Rockefeller, who at the time was one of the richest people in the world. And, and he summed this up because he was asked by a reporter how much money he reckoned he needed to live on comfortably. And he replied, a little bit more than I have. You know, most of us, from those of us perhaps who are maybe struggling or finding it difficult, to those of us who are pretty comfortable, if we're honest, really, really honest, we might be tempted to say amen to his statement. You know, in fact, that I came across some research a little while ago which highlighted that a very, very large proportion of lottery winners, including the big winners, still continued to play it because they didn't want to miss out just in case because they hadn't just won enough. Money and the pursuit of it, it's management, it's power, it's attractiveness. Money by what it brings in terms of consumption and lifestyle. You know, it sloshes around our culture and our media. You know, if we're honest, if it's in danger of, of having soaked our values, seeped into our lives, not only our minds and our decisions, but even made it into our hearts. So let's just be brutally honest. There are no places to hide, no places to escape. You know, to tweak the famous song, money makes the world go round. However, money might, or, or importantly, the love of money might just lead us and the world the wrong way, away from God. So how? How do we live in, fr in the freedom that Jesus won for us in this money mad world? Well, Paul addresses both the average Christian in Ephesus first uh, and then in that second passage, the wealthy, the comfortable Christians. Uh, and there is no escape for any of us because I'm sure by certain criteria we would fit in both categories. So there is support, there is encouragement and there is most definitely challenge. You know, he starts, starts off in the, past, the verse that I want to just focus on. You know, in verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul's emphasis is clear, namely that covetousness, I can't say the word, but desire is a self-destructive evil, whereas simplicity and contentment are beautiful Christ-like virtues. In a word, he's not for poverty against wealth, but for perspective and contentment against, against covetousness. And he's for humility and generosity against greed and hoarding. So there are four little tools important tools that we can use to protect us and to maintain our freedom in a money mad world. The first one, it, we come across it in verses seven and eight. We need to put money and the love of money and the desire for money into perspective. You know, he says, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. He strongly argues for the average follower of Jesus for contentment and against covetousness by reminding us of a fundamental but often ignored fact of our human experience relating to our birth and death, putting it all into some sobering perspective. You know, we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. And a truth that many of Israel's finest over the generations had reflected upon. You know, Job's version of it is when he says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall depart. That is, we were born naked and penniless and when we die, we are buried naked and penniless. In respect of earthly possessions, our entry and exit are identical. So our life on earth is just that brief journey between those two moments. We brought nothing with us and we can take nothing away with us. As the officiating minister said at a funeral of a wealthy lady, when asked by the curious how much she'd left, 
He just quietly replied, she left everything. It's a sobering perspective which should temper and influence our economic lifestyle and our choices. Money and possessions are only the travelling luggage of time, they're not the stuff of eternity. And it would be therefore sensible to travel light and as Jesus himself commanded us not to store up for ourselves, that's accumulate selfishly treasures on earth. So we need to put things into perspective. And then Paul talks about, in verses 9 and 10, about contentment versus desiring and the love of money. You know, he moves on to talk about for this average Christian who wants to get rich, who is motivated by the love of money. He records, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You see, the Old Testament is full of uh, admonitions uh, against this desire, this covetousness, especially the wisdom literature. We're warned that money is addictive since whoever loves money never has money enough. We're told not to be overawed by the wealthy, but to remember they will leave their wealth behind them. It's also explicitly stated that one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. And so we should pray to be given neither poverty nor riches, but our daily bread, the necessities of life. Jesus knew all of that from that Old Testament wisdom and he endorses us it, telling us to be aware of greed and reminding us that our life doesn't consist of abundance of our possessions. But Paul now takes up that same theme and traces the downfall of those who go after money, who covet it. People who want to get rich fall. They fall into a temptation and a trap and they would lose their freedom. And the amazing thing is that they do it themselves. When they pray that, you know, that God will never do it to them, but they lead themselves into temptation, indeed into multiple temptations. And the trap that they and we fall into is materialism and moral compromise. You know, we can become ready to sacrifice duty and conscience to the pursuit of wealth. And then he also identifies that covetous people fall into many foolish and harmful desires. You know, of of course, greed is itself selfish and idolatrous, but it breeds other desires because money is a drug And that desire for money is a very, very powerful addiction. The more you have, the more you want. Yet these further desires are foolish, that they can't be defended. And they're harmful because they captivate us and they don't liberate us. And the third and final stage in the downfall of desiring and chasing after money is that they those wrong desires plunge them into ruin and destruction. The irony is that those who set their hearts on gain end in total loss, the loss of their integrity and indeed of themselves. For as Jesus asked, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? But in order to enforce this solemn warning, Paul now quotes what seems to have been a current proverb For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. What then are those evils which the love of money is a major cause of? You know, I could give you a very long list, but Paul concentrates on only two evils which spring from this unhealthy desire and lust for money. First, some uh, eager for money have wandered from the faith. It's not possible to pursue truth and money, God and mammon simultaneously. People either renounce avarice in their commitment to their faith or they make 
money their God and depart from their faith. Secondly, they've pierced themselves with many griefs, or they spike themselves on many a painful thorn, in one translation says. What these griefs and these thorns are, Paul doesn't talk about, but they could include worry and remorse and pangs of, of a disregarded conscience, the discovery of materialism that can never satisfy our spirits and, and just cause finally despair. A very famous 19th century American financer who died worth $100 million is said to have exclaimed with his dying breath, I'm the most miserable devil in the world. The cost and struggle of being content is cheap compared to the cost of covetousness. For a follower of Jesus. So to live in that freedom in a money mad world, keep it in perspective and seek to be content and avoid the real dangers of coveting, chasing after more for more's sake. And then when we come to verses 17 and 19, Paul moves on to talk to the rich Christians who are rich in the present world, he says. You know, and of course, wealth and poverty are relative terms in, in all of this, and we can probably fall into either category. But the first thing to notice in these verses is that Paul doesn't talk directly about giving it all away. Instead, he gives negative and positive instruction. First, a warning the rich, you know, that there are dangers, uh, and then laying down some obligations for them. So first of all, he says that we as rich people, if we're to live free, we need to do it through humility. He says in verse 17, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, which richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. You know, the first danger which wealth can expose is pride. Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant. The Old Testament clearly warned people of this as well. Wealth often gives birth to vanity. It tends to make people feel self-important. It, it makes us look down on others. If we're honest, we, and also when we've seen maybe other people, when we feel a little bit comfortable and a little bit wealthy, we can boast or feel superior because of our house, because of our furniture, because of our car, because of our possessions. Therefore, when we've got wealth, we're to have an even greater amount of humility. And the second danger to which the rich and the wealthy are exposed is a false security. You know, he talks, command those who are rich in the present world not to put their hope in wealth. To do so is foolishly short-sighted. For one thing, you know, wealth is so uncertain. Jesus warned us of the ravages of moths and rust and burglars. And we wouldn't want to add fire and inflation and tax as further hazards. Many people have gone to bed rich and woken up poor. For another thing, the proper object of our human trust is not a thing, but a person. Not wealth but God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. The two dangers then to, to which we, the rich and the wealthy and the comfortable, are exposed to are, are that sense of false pride looking down on people and a false sense of security, trusting in the gift instead of the giver. In this way, wealth can spoil life's two paramount relationships, causing us to figure out God and to despise our neighbour. The wealthy, and that's us, are in need of humility to remain free. And last but not least, we have to live with generosity. Timothy is, is to not only warn the rich of the perils, but also to warn them and encourage them what they need to do. They need to have that sense of responsibility. 
you know, in a sense, if you go through like the skeleton of verses 17 and 18, it command those who are rich to be rich more fully. Command the rich in this present world to be rich in good deeds. Wealth can, if you're if we're honest, can make us a little bit lazy. You know, there's that great phrase, the idle rich. So Timothy is to command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share, to use their wealth to relieve, want and promote good causes. And in doing so, they will be imitating God. For he is rich, yet out of his riches, he richly provides us with everything we need. So since God is such a generous giver, his people, we should be generous too not only in imitation of his generosity, but also because of the colossal needs of the world around us. And secondly, Timothy must seek to develop the rich, you know, to give them a sense of proportion. You know, in verse 19, in this way they'll lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This treasure for themselves which the wealthy lay up by their generosity. It is clearly not material treasure, for for Jesus specifically told us not to do this. It's rather a spiritual treasure they're building up, which is literally a good foundation for the future. So which is more valuable? Is it to be rich in this age or in the age to come? Is it to accumulate treasure on earth or in heaven? Is it to make a lot of money now or to take hold of the life that is truly life? Bringing together Paul's negative and positive instructions to the wealthy in a money mad world, they are not to be proud, they are not to despise the poor, but to be good and to be generous. They're not to fix their hopes on uncertain riches, but on God the giver, And on that most valuable of all his gifts, the treasure of eternal life. You know, these passages offer us problems and encouragement to live freely in a money mad world. So are we going to, with the prompting of the Holy Spirit, uh, are we going to be honest to look at our lives and into our hearts, and into our minds, and into our choices, and allow the Spirit to convict us, to show us where we are trapped and imprisoned by money, and the desire for money, and possessions, and wealth. You know, Paul's balanced wisdom becomes apparent when you look over those two passages, and we have in them a really healthy quadrilateral of Christian living in regard money and wealth. We need to keep it in perspective. We need to live in contentment. We need to live with humility. And we need to live with generosity. There's a final warning and a final passage. You know, simply put, if we love money, we use God and people. However, if we love God and follow his son and our saviour Jesus, we live free using money to love God and people. And that final passage, Paul writes in a different letter to the Philippians. Not that I was ever in need. For I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. All the way my 
Doubt is too. Thank you for joining us today on GFM at Home. Just a couple final notices. First off, over the last few months, we've had some great kids' parties on Zoom. And on the 27th of March, in the evening, we're having an Easter-themed kids' party on Zoom. Angie Dennison and her team have done a great job putting them together. Kids, make sure you watch GFM Kids. It's got a little video on there telling you what to expect. There's a goodie bag to pick up on the Saturday morning. It's gonna be great fun. And finally, just to remind you that from next week, we'll be premiering our videos on YouTube, which means they won't be available until 10.30 a.m. on the Sunday, but then we can all watch it together and engage in the chat together. If you really can't make it at 10.30, the video will still be available afterwards. You just won't be able to chat in the settings. But other than that, we hope you have a great week. Goodbye from our new building. See you soon.